And so today we're talking about Jesus, the Lord of our possessions, through this story uh, of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. Now, before we begin, we need to recognize that um, he is not a fool because he is rich. He's not called a fool because he is rich. Rather, what he does with his riches that proves himself to be a fool. So we need to be careful to know that he is not a fool because he's rich. Rather, what he does with what's been given to him, uh, he proves himself to be a fool. Now, if you'll remember last week in Luke chapter 11, we started to talk about Jesus, the Lord of our motives, and we've seen the Pharisees and Jesus bump heads. And at the very beginning of Luke chapter 12, which we, we kind of skipped over before this story, Jesus begins a set of teachings that will provide the framework from Luke 12 to 20, where Jesus is moving closer towards Jerusalem and his disciples need to start remembering what Jesus is saying. So Jesus starts to say these short one-line sayings or maxims through Luke 12 to 20. There's tons of them as we read this because as they head towards Jerusalem, things are now going to get more intense for the disciples and they're going to need uh, more focused teaching from Jesus and that they would remember what he says. As they head towards Jerusalem, it gets more difficult. So even in Luke 12 alone, here's what Jesus said, uh, some of these short sayings that he says. And as we track through Luke 12 all the way up to 20, you'll see uh, some of these sayings coming out more and more and more because after 20, they head towards Jerusalem and it gets very intense. So in Luke 12 alone, he said, don't be afraid, you're worth more than many sparrows, Luke 12, 7. One's life is not in the abundance of his possessions, which we'll get to today, 15, Luke 12, 15. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes, 1223. Seek his kingdom and these things will be provided for you, 1231. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, 1234. So Jesus starts this teaching, this block of teaching that sets us up from 12 to 20 on, uh, as Jesus nears to Jerusalem and starts to get more focused. Because at the beginning of chapter 12, you'll see what does the Bible say at the beginning of chapter 12 of Luke? It says, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered... Many thousands of people had gathered, and the crowd was getting larger and larger as Jesus was moving towards Jerusalem. Thousands of people, they were trampling each other, it says. And then Jesus sets out his teaching. And today in this uh, talk of Lord of our possessions, uh, the, the main verse of 1234, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because Jesus wants us to determine how our level of commitment to him and where our heart is. And where our treasure is, he says, our heart will be also. I came across this story this week on Facebook of all places. It said, there was a man who had worked all of his life and had saved all of his money. He was real cheap when it came to his money. He loved money more than just about anything. And just before he died, he said to his wife, now listen, when I die, I want you to take all my money, all my cash, place it in the casket with me because I want to take all my cash with me to the afterlife. So he got his wife to promise him with all her heart that when he died, she would put all the money in the casket with him. Then one day he died. He was stretched out in the, ta in the casket. The wife was sitting there in black next to, her, next to their best friend. When they finished the ceremony, just before closing the casket, the wife said, wait a minute. She had a shoebox with her. She came over with the box, placed it in the casket. Then the undertakers locked the casket and rolled it away. Her friend said... I hope you weren't crazy enough to put all that money in there, all that cash in there with him. She said, yes, I promised. I'm a good Christian. I can't lie. I promised him that I would have put his money in the casket with him, all of his cash or his money. You mean to tell me that you put every cent of his money in the casket with him? She said, I sure did, said the wife. I got it all together, put it into my bank account, and wrote him a check. <laughs> <laughs> You get that? It took me a while, actually, to catch the, what was happening there, but you can't cash a check in the after... Nah. So put all the money in the... Yeah, you get it. Because what, the, what we'll get to today as we talk about our possessions is that they are uh, with, with us for here in the present, but they're not coming with us. First Timothy, Paul tells the Timothy, we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out with us. So what happens with this rich fool is not because he's a rich that he's a fool, but rather what he does with his riches that makes him a fool. It's a, it's a problem with his stewardship of what he's been given. So here we come to this teaching in uh, Luke 12 on the parable of the um, rich fool. Now what had happened previously to this story starting is Jesus is telling 
Remember, at the end of Luke 11, Jesus and the Pharisees are butting heads, and the Pharisees go out and try to catch him. They're trying to trap him. It says, in fact, that they opposed him fiercely. And so as we start Luke chapter 12, before we get to the parable of the rich fool, Jesus goes on to, on a, a bunch of teachings here in 12 verses before the parable starts, saying, watch out for the Pharisees, they're hypocrites. The Pharisees were just trying to trap him. Now Jesus is telling his disciples and the thousands that were gathering, watch out for the Pharisees because they're hypocrites. They preach it, but they don't practice it. Then he will say, you're, more valuable, to God, you're value, more valuable to God than many sparrows. Don't be afraid for whatever you're going to face. Jesus is preaching to them, preaching hard to his followers right there. He says, don't worry about what you say when you're dragged before the synagogues and the authorities. So Jesus is giving them a warning saying, you're about to face something difficult. Don't worry, I'm with you and my spirit will give you the words to speak. So Jesus is preaching well. I want you to hear this. Jesus is preaching and preaching and preaching to his people. And then this story happens, which, which, as Jesus is preaching and saying, be on your guard, watch out. First, he says, watch out for the Pharisees. They're going to try to trap you. And then he says, when you do get caught, when you do get taken before the, the courts, don't worry about what to say because I'll be with you. My, Holy, my spirit will be in you. And so as Jesus is preaching, the greatest preacher of all time is preaching and giving it, preaching and preaching and preaching. It does my heart well to know that even the greatest preacher of all time had people in uh, that were just had something else on their mind. So as Jesus is preaching all this, as you see in our, in our text here, as Jesus is preaching, someone in the crowd came to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So that person, not listening to all that Jesus had just said, tries to distract Jesus from what he's doing and what he's saying. And he says, teacher, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. As a youth pastor, I used to preach and preach and preach and preach all the time, and, and then I'd see hands go up at the end. I said, wow, these guys are really, they're really getting it here. And then they'd ask, can I go to the bathroom? Uh, when he comes back, can I go? Can I have a snack? When's the, <laughs> when's the snack? What's for snack? What are we doing next week? And Jesus is preaching, and all of a sudden, someone comes up, obviously not listening, and says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And look at Jesus' response. He replied, man... Who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to him, watch out. Beware of, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So here we have Jesus preaching to thousands. Facing, then turns to his disciples and is preaching. Someone comes in, teacher, that's all well and good, but can you tell my uh, brother to divide the inheritance with me? Let's see what happens. Here's the request. Tell, tell my brother to split the inheritance. In the Old Testament, we'll find that uh, when, a, when a f- brothers are going to get the inheritance, the two-thirds of the inheritance goes to the older brother, one-third of the inheritance goes to the younger brother, uh, two, pro- two portions for Joseph in Ezekiel 47, 13, and then in Deuteronomy. He must acknowledge the son of his unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double share of all that he has, Deuteronomy 21 and 17. So in this story, this younger brother is coming to Jesus and saying, give me my share of the inheritance. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And this is something that rabbis were often asked to do in, the old, t- in, in old times, was to make a decision on Jewish law, if you want to look at John 8 for a reference for that. So the younger brother comes to Jesus Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, as a younger brother, I can spot when a younger brother is acting like a younger brother. So this younger brother is going to Jesus, I want what's mine. And me, as a younger brother, um, had many opportunities to prove that I was the youngest brother. Um, One time, we were at uh, camp, as we've talked about, we've done camp before, and it was not uncommon for my mom or parents to send us a care package, right? that had goodies for us to take in camp. And most times the box would say with a letter, here's all this stuff divided evenly between you. And so when we'd get the package, we'd just start going for it. And as a younger brother, I'd have to get what I could get before my older brother got it. So in this particular instance, there was two uh, bottles of Gatorade and about 25 uh, little uh, juice box things. I I don't know the exact term of it. But anyway, we went in there, and I took a Gatorade and all the juice boxes. 
So my, <laughs> looking back, I feel like I, I might not have divided it properly, but he took the Gatorade and had some of the snack food, and then he came over to the, he had the nerve to come over to where I was with all the Gatorade and the, the juice boxes and take about half of the, the, uh, the juice boxes from me. I said, you can't do that. We're supposed to divide it evenly. We're supposed to divide that evenly. So this was um, also the opening day for our camp, so we had to wear nice white T-shirts that had the staff on it. And all of a sudden, as he was taking the juice boxes, I was taking the juice boxes, one thing left, led to another, and we just started whipping the juice boxes at each other. <laughs> Fastball. Like, he, he took a juice box and just chucked it at me so fast, and it hit me right here. Ooh, I might still have the bruising from that one. And then I got one, and I chucked it so fast, and I connected to his, <laughs> to his hand. I remember it exploded and went all over his white shirt. And, and so that whole day, me and him were walking around camp with our white T-shirts on with uh, juice stains. <laughs> juice stains all over us. Actually, for the rest of the summer, we had juice stains on us because we were fighting over what was, gi- what was given to us. And it's good to know as, as a younger brother that this was, uh, this was happening for long, long times ago where younger brothers were fighting for, the, <laughs> fighting for their inheritance. So this younger brother comes to Jesus and says, give me what's mine. But Jesus, not sidetracked for a moment, here's what Jesus' response is. He says, why are you asking me? Why are you asking me? Why are you bringing that to me? That's why he says, man. He says, man, man. In the Greek, man. Man, why are you asking me this? Because Jesus, again, was so focused on what his mission was that he didn't get sidetracked. He refused to be sidetracked from his mission to look into this situation that the younger brother is giving to him, but he did, as the greatest teacher of all time, use it as an opportunity uh, to teach, a teachable moment. Then he says, watch out. Watch out. And when Jesus says, watch out, you better watch out. And so in Luke, we'll see Jesus say, watch out or take heed or beware many times. Earlier, he said, take heed how you listen. Take care how you're listening. Uh, And he said, beware lest the light in you is actually darkness. We've already covered this. Then he'll say uh, earlier in Luke 12, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Later, he'll say, beware that you don't hold on to forgiveness. Watch out for that. Then he'll say, watch out for false teachers. Then he'll say, watch out as the day is drawing near that you don't put your pleasures in earthly things. So Jesus, over the course of Luke's gospel, will continually tell us to watch out, beware, take heed. If Jesus says, watch out, beware, take heed, then we ought to pay attention to it as well. He says, watch out, your desire can lead to greed. Now, greed has also been an ongoing theme in Jesus' training of his disciples meaning that the possessions that they were having or the, the riches, the, the riches can be either helpful or harmful. And so as Jesus is teaching his disciples or uh, training his disciples over the gospel of Luke, you'll see greed come up many times in either uh, implied or otherwise out in the open. Here's a couple of examples. Calling of Le- Levi, the tax collector. The parable of the sower about the thorns of the riches that choke the spiritual life. The Pharisees who are inside are full of greed. Giving a party in order to be reciprocated by one's rich friends, that's in Luke 14. The prodigal son will squander all of his wealth, that's in Luke 15. The parable of the unjust servant, that's in Luke 16. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus, also in Luke 16. So Jesus, this is a very important teaching for Jesus as he's talking about riches and money and possessions. In fact, he he talks more about uh, riches than he does about heaven and hell combined in the Bible. So here's what um, Jesus says, your desire can lead to greed. And here's the problem. Greed will define as an overwhelming urge to have more of something, usually more than what we need. That's gonna be our working definition today as we walk through this story. So here's the, in Exodus, it's even listed as one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Eugene Peterson sums it up like this. Don't set your heart on anything that is your neighbor's. That's where greed comes in. So as we walk through this, we see the problems that happen with greed. And I want to give you four Four problems with greed as we start, and then we'll look into this story and see what it has to say for us today and to make sure our hearts are aligned with Jesus and not into our possessions. Greed often leads to envy. 
Here's what the Bible says. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So the first thing, greed can lead to envy. Second thing, it can lead, it often leads to indebtedness. Meaning that the more and more and more and more and more that we want and get, the more debt that we occur. And that's what the Bible says in Romans 13, 8. Let no, no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. So the Bible is giving us another picture of love being the thing that we need to be pursuing and not our things. Third thing about greed. Causes a person to lose an eternal perspective. Lose an eternal perspective. And I got a few scriptures that cover greed that hopefully that these scriptures will uh, uh, help us as we walk through this story together. Ephesians 5 and 5. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idol idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Ephesians 5 and 5. The thing about uh, this is there's many scriptures for, for greed in the Bible, and I want to just march through three or four here. Colossians 3 and 5, put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature. Greed is listed in what belongs to your earthly na nature, and Paul says to put it to death. Put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. And then it says, Paul says what greed is. It is idolatry. It is putting something before Jesus, something before God, and that becomes an idol. Greed, which is idolatry. Ephesians 5, it says, but among you there must not even be a hint. So Paul uses strong language in, on a list of sins and in, in, includes greed in them. There not, must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or in any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. One more, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That might be a word for some of us to hear today because it tells us to be content with what we have, not to put our hopes and our trusts in our riches, but in God. And we'll get to this later when Paul says, put our hopes in God who richly provides us with everything. Not our hopes in our riches, but our hopes in God who richly provides us for everything. Once again, the rich fool is a fool because of the way he uses his riches, not because he's rich. Here's the fourth problem with greed. It can lead to other sins. Because one thing about greed that you need to know is that it hides itself from its victims. Meaning that we can't see our own greed. We can't see if we have a greed. It hides from us. And so we need to make sure that we are uh, aligned with the Lord who speaks to our hearts and lets us know where these things are. Uh, greed can lead to other sins. And here's a couple bumper stickers that I, that as Jesus came and said, the, a person's life is not measured by what he owns, or in other words, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Here's a bumper sticker said, he who dies with the most toys wins. And then another bumper sticker said, he who dies with the most toys still dies. So they, they, I, don't know, I don't really know which one they want to go with, but... Uh, as we talk about this story, we're going to move now to where Jesus, this is Jesus' conclusion to the younger brother saying, your life is, is, consists more of the abundance of your possessions. You need to find where your priorities are and not put your hope in your possessions, in your riches, but in God who richly provides. It's Jesus saying to this younger brother. And then he turns to his disciples and tells this story. We read it already. Let's read it again. This is Luke 12, 16 to 21. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain, man, certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and then I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. So as we look at this story that Jesus tells, I want to just point out two things uh, quickly and then go through a list of things that we can be uh, observant of in our own lives as well as we see the rich fool here. So here's the two things about this story. First, there was a man who was very successful. As we can see, he 
had enough to build bigger barns and more grain to, to know what to do with. And what, like I said, the problem wasn't that he was rich or successful. It wasn't that he was, had success. So it wasn't his success. So let's get this clear. It wasn't his savings. It wasn't sinful for him to save or to be successful. And it wasn't his ambition to work hard. Because it's not a bad thing as when your land produces plentifully, as what verse 16 says. It's not a bad thing when your business prospers, when you get a promotion or a pay increase. Those are not bad things. It's not a bad thing when your investments increase in value. This is not evil in this parable. He is called the, he's not called the fool for being a productive farmer. Okay? What's wrong with him is his attitude, not the amount of things that he has. His attitude towards them, like I've already stated. And his way of handling his riches show, show that he puts his hope in his riches and that his treasure is found in his riches where Jesus wants us not to put our treasure in the riches and the things that we own, but in Jesus, to highly value Jesus in the things that we own. Um, that's why Paul will tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 17, command those who are rich in this present world to be not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So those were, his problems were not this, but his problems were selfishness and greed, as we've already talked about greed. Selfishness and greed. And I believe there are five ways, as we look through this text, starting in verse 16, five ways that this man shows himself to be a fool and will be helpful for us to look as we care for our own possessions. The first thing that he proved himself to be selfish and greedy and to be a fool was that he didn't give God credit he didn't give God credit for the crops. Look at verse 16. The ground of a certain man yielded an abundant harvest. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop even, Luke 12, 16. So he has produced this good crop, and all the Bible says is that the ground of a certain man produced a good crop. Now, when the crop came to him, he didn't first think, thank you, God, for this crop. Thank you for what you've blessed me with. So he did not give God credit for the crops. He left God out of the equation. That's in verse 16. You can see that he was in his own strength. The land produced plentifully a good crop. He didn't give God credit. He didn't think of others, only himself. He didn't think of others, only himself. Look at what it says again. And it's helpful if you, have, if you like to mark up your Bible to to circle or line all the I, me's, and my's in this, this section of text. Because the rich fool was aggressively self-centered. Instead of denying himself, as Jesus says, he was aggressively affirming himself. In the original Greek, the word my appears four times and I eight times. And so here's what, let's read this again and I'll accent where it's all about him and not about others. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and I will store all my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. So this uh, rich fool was aggressively self-centered, and our problem is when we get more and more and more of things, we become even more self-centered. We become more of uh, the focus on us and not on Jesus, that it would become more about me and my and I and not about him, not about what he has done for us. Not, he doesn't get the glory. It all becomes credit to us. And that's what we see here in verses 17 to 19. Um, Warren, Warren Wearsby has this quote. The material blessings of life are either a mirror in which we see ourselves or a window through which we see God. And I thought that was an interesting quote for us here today, that the things that we get are either a mirror through which we see ourselves, which is selfishness and greed, and we get more and more and more and say it's all about me, or a window through which we see God, that we give blessing back to God for what he's given to us, and we see him in those possessions. Uh, this rich fool lived only for the moment, as you'll see in verse 19. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up, for many years, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, the chief motto of the worldly value system is eat, drink, and be merry. So this man had plenty laid up for many years, and he says, eat, drink, and be merry, as he talks to himself. 
And the Bible will say this. This is what Paul says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. He says, If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? Because people were saying that there was no resurrection. There was no afterlife to be in, in hope for. And he says, Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. And that's what's happening with the rich fool. Let us eat, drink, and be merry because there's no hope beyond what he was doing. He was living only for his moment, only for the time that he was there. Look at what James 4 and 13 and 16 says. Now listen to you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. While you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live or do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. So here's Jesus also saying this. You don't know what's going to happen to you. And so he lived only for his moment and not hopeful towards eternity. And, fin and finally, or second to last, he was a keeper instead of a giver. Meaning he was confused between ownership and stewardship. He wanted to keep all that he had for himself and not give it for anybody else. I heard a a very weird story one time that I think I'll share with you here this morning, just to mix it up a little bit. Um, there was a fisherman who went fishing, and so he passed by a, uh, uh, the, the warden every time he went into this lake to go fishing. And remember, I told you it was a weird story, but listen to it. So the fisherman goes into the lake and starts fishing, and he's the only one in the whole lake that gets fish. And he has a whole bunch of fish, and he goes back through the, game, the warden and waves goodnight. The next day, he goes in. About 10 or 11 other people go in, too. He's the only one that comes back with fish, waves to the game warden on his way back. See you later. Next two days, he does the same thing, waves to the game warden on his way with the only one who catches fish. So the warden the next day stops him and says, I want to come with you. I want to see what you're doing to get fish where nobody else is getting fish. And so he takes the game warden with him to go fishing. And so as they're starting their day out fishing, uh, uh, the fisherman, and here's where it gets weird, the fisherman takes out a stick of dynamite and lights it and throws it in the water. And boom, all the fish come up and he takes all the fish. And the game warden says, you can't do that. What are you doing? You can't do that. That's illegal. I'm going to take you. And so the fisherman takes another stick of dynamite and hands it to the warden. What are you going to do? What are you going to do now? So the, the warden at that point, knowing that it was illegal, said, I, wonder, I, I don't know what to do with this. And he chucks it in the water and more fish. So the game warden had to do it because the dynamite was going to explode on him. And the reason I share that weird story is because I think that a lot of times the things that were given to us, the things that we uh, even earn and the things that we put our, our hopes in and our possessions in the wrong way can be very hazardous to us. If we don't steward them properly, they can become very hazardous to us. If we steward them properly as Jesus encourages us and teaches us to do it, it can be very helpful to not only us, to others as well. It can be either helpful or hazardous. And the game warden, in that little story, uh, realized what was hazardous and what, was gonna, what he had to do. And so I want to say the rich fool was a keeper instead of a giver. And when we become more keepers and keepers and keepers and collectors of our things and putting our hopes in our riches, uh, it becomes hazardous. So here's what the rich fool did. He said, uh, God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you and who will get what you have prepared for yourself? So Jesus says, this very night something's going to happen, and who's going to get all that stuff? The stuff that he collected became hazardous for him, and so then he was called a fool because he was foolish in the way he stewarded his property. And the final thing that he did was he was, conf he was in conflict with God's plan in conflict with God's plan in verse 21. You'll see this. This is how it will be with, this is how Jesus sums up his story. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. So as you store up things for yourselves, as Jesus is telling this story, he was in conflict with what God's plan was for his life, didn't know what he was doing as he collected his things and become very hazardous for him. So here's the, here's, that was the parable, and here's what it means for us today. Four quick things of what it means for us today as we look at putting our hopes in, in the certainty of Christ and not in the uncertainty of riches. Here's the prescription, we'll call it. Acknowledge that God is the owner of everything. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. 
God is the owner of everything. Psalm 24 and 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Acknowledge that God owns everything. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. So the first step in giving God praise through our prayer through, through our possessions, is recognizing that it was a gift from him and it was by him and for him. We can recognize that our possessions and the things that we own were by him and for him and that he is the owner of everything. The author of Hebrews will, will say that God is the builder of everything. Every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. He is the creator. He is the one by whom and for whom all things are, exist. Number two, practice generosity. Meaning as you look through the possessions of your own life, see how you can be generous to others in every, in every situation. Even in the smallest ways, you can give. This is what the rich fool did not do. He kept, he did not give. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water, as Matthew says, uh, to one of these little ones, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. So Jesus wanting us to practice generosity in our lives. Number three, model unselfishness to others. What the rich fool gives us is a story of greed, a story of selfishness, a story of all about me. Jesus wants us to practice caring for others. And in fact, the closer that we get to Jesus, the closer we'll get to one another, the closer that we'll get to reflecting Jesus to one another as we get closer and closer to him. And this unselfish behavior will become contagious. And finally, number four, live with eternity in mind, meaning that there is a hope. There is a hope for this life. There is a hope for later. There's a hope that can be found in Jesus, not in our possessions. The rich fool, again, foolish not because of his riches, but foolish of how he stewarded it without looking towards eternity, uh, without eternity in mind. Here's what he'll, Luke will say later. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted where no thief near or nor moth destroys. For where your heart is, there your treasure will. Be. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Jesus, again through this story, teaching to his disciples that it's not about more and more that you can consume. It's how you can steward the resources that he gives you for his glory. Uh, the, I'll end with this story. I'll end with this story and a challenge for us as we leave this place. There's a well-known pastor who was invited to dinner of a very wealthy man. After the meal, the host led him to a place where they could get a good view of the surrounding area. Pointing to the oil wells, puncturing the landscape, he boasted, 25 years ago, I had nothing. Now, as far as you can see, it's all mine. Looking in the opposite direction at his sprawling fields of grain, he said, that's all mine too. Turning east toward huge herds of cattle, he bragged, they're all mine. Mine. Then pointing to the west in the beautiful forest, he exclaimed to the pastor, those too all mine. Probably patted his chest like that. Then pointing to the west, they're all mine. He paused, expecting the pastor to compliment him on his great successes. But the pastor, however, placing one hand on the man's shoulder, pointed heavenward with, with the other, simply said, how much do you have in that direction? The man hung his head and confessed, I never thought of that. I want to end today asking us, how much do we have in that direction? where Jesus is, seated next to the Father, our hope, our treasure. And I want to challenge us as we live our lives to put our hope and faith and our, make Christ our highest priority. And then it will change the way we view our possessions. We'll look at our possessions and we'll see how God can use us through those. Making him our highest priority and letting us have treasure in heaven for where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Let's pray. God, thanks for this, your, your word. Thanks for the truths that are found in your scriptures. I pray that each and every one of us would uh, make sure our hearts are aligned with you so that where our hearts are, our treasure will be as well. 
Jesus, I pray that you would teach each of us to use our possessions, to steward them well, acknowledging that you are the owner of all things, and to you be the glory for all the things that we possess, that every good and every perfect gift comes from you, and I pray that we would be bold in the way that we live our lives with our possessions. Um, God, we pray that um, in all things, you'd be glorified in our lives. Thank you for this opportunity that we've had to, to hear from your word, and I pray that we would be people who respond to your word who let it sink into our hearts and then impact our actions throughout the week. So God, I pray you'd take this, your word, and allow it to uh, resonate with us and then put it into action this week. So thank you. We give you the praise and the glory that only you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.